Hi, you guys. Welcome back. This is Richard Sachs, and you're listening to Lost Arts Radio. And we have a treat tonight that I wanted to try to get for us to bring back Dr. Christopher Busby who to talk about radiation issues and nuclear issues. And the reason is we've been having a lot of questions lately that came up from a couple of videos uh, focused around a, a quote from um, a nuclear scientist who was an expert in starting in the 40s and 50s and up through the 80s, uh, Galen Windsor. And he was talking about the misconception of certain aspects of the danger of radiation. I, I listened to the whole larger video that I found with him very carefully, and I couldn't see any place where he was denying the reality of the bombs dropped on Japan and other things like that. But he was questioning the danger of the radiation itself, not as a bomb, but when they worked on it in fuel processing plants. And we're going to talk to Dr. Busby about that. And before that idea came up, I really wanted to get him on on the general uh, principles that nuclear uh, energy production works on as well as nuclear weapons so that we got a basic understanding to come from. So welcome, Dr. Busby, and thanks for coming on short notice. I appreciate it. Um. I'm thinking of where to start, and maybe since the whole Galen Windsor issue is about fuel, um, how nuclear power is produced, the basics of that, and then, uh, and before that, just to let people know that you're not a casual observer, you've got some background in this area. You want to just quickly go over that, not to use up too much of our time, but just to say where you're coming from. Well, I'm, I'm a chemical physicist originally. Um, with PhDs in chemical physics. Uh, I got interested in radiation and health around about the 1990s, but as, as, a, as, a, as a physical chemist, as a chemist, I, I, I was taught about how, how um, you know, where, what radiation is, where it comes from, how it works, how, how, some, how some elements transmute into other elements, all, all that sort of basic nuclear physics I did at university. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, I've done a lot of studies uh, in relation to court cases that I've done, which follow from the epidemiology that I've done relating to the health effects of being exposed to, to, to radiation, particularly internal radiation. So that's like when you mm -hmm. eat something radioactive. Um, so I'm generally now con conceded to be an international expert in this area. And, and, and in fact, I am. <laughs> So I've published more than 50 papers in this area, and I've studied it for the last 30 years. Okay. Uh, sometimes I wish I hadn't, but I mean, it has been, it has, it, I've sort of fanatically devoted myself to understanding all, all this stuff to do with radiation, because it covers an awful lot of fields apart from the, the, the science, it covers the fields of sociology and philosophy and medicine and uh, an enormously broad spectrum of necessary knowledge in order to understand what's going on. And one problem, of course, is we will talk about this with this guy, Galen Windsor. Mm -hmm. If you don't know all of these things and you only know one little bit of them, you can look at all of the facts that you know and you can conclude things which are actually false. Which, I think, isn't that a problem throughout education now in general? It's a, it's oh, entirely, oh. It's, yes, it is entirely a problem surrounding education. Uh, in fact, it's, it's got increasingly worse since the 70s. Um, it's sort of atom, atomized um, the study of reality <laughs> in such a way right. that rational thought, what we might call rational thought in each of these areas, can be considered to be valid and their conclusions can be considered to be rationally valid, but overall they're completely wrong because they don't take into consideration things in areas which which they don't know about. That's the context in a wider term terminology, right? Yeah. So that if you learn a specialty and you don't know what it's related to or all the things that affect it, then you draw the wrong conclusions. Well, I have to say that I think science science died quite a long time ago. I mean, scientists uh, are people who do jobs, and the job is scientist, <laughs> and you're paid to be a scientist, and, and you're paid to publish things in that area, and that's your job. And right. very often and increasingly, your job is to support the continuing 
pollution of the planet with substances with, with substances which are quite clearly capable or indeed do kill people. Right. Uh, and your job is to defend the, the, the companies that, that make these things um, from being sued in the courts and from being uh, shut down. It seems to, to be the case that in school, instead of learning to question everything, which should be the basis of science, that you learn to repeat memorized acceptable information. Yes, correct. Correct. I mean, my, my daughter, my eldest daughter, Celia, she, she went to Cambridge. Well, a lot of my children went there, but she, she was the first one to go to Cambridge. And I told her to study chemistry, physics, and physiology, because I believe in, you know, there's a big lack of understanding about how bodies work, how, about how, how, life, how life functions. So I wanted her to go and do that, but she was so angry about the way she was attacked for questioning the things that they, mm. they all had to learn in order to pass the exams. Yes. She walked out. Wow. And she went to become a, she, they didn't like that, they, so she went to become a social anthropologist in order to try and understand why people believe what they believe. Mm. And she became a very famous, famous social anthropologist, but she gave up science because she said that it was bunk. Yeah. You have to get through it by keeping your mouth closed these days. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and once you get through it, then if you go to work in the area, whoever you work for, even for a university now, you're not allowed to, to look at things which you're not allowed to look at. Right. So I think that's one of the credentials that people who understand that would look for is who is the speaker beholden to? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, when, when I, I was approached long ago in 2006 or something by some people from Fallujah, Iraq, saying that, that all the babies were dying of congenital malformations and so forth. And I said, why do you come to me? They said, because everybody attacks you. And so you must be right. <laughs> That's a strong criteria. Yeah. 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 With, with at least in our well, not right, Not right, but independent anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't mean that you know everything. It no. means that you may actually be making an honest effort. Yeah. Well, anyway, so people, the, the extent to which people attack me and scientists attack me is directly proportional to my success. Success in what? what Suc well, success in publishing country. now. I mean, I pub I'm publishing lots of, you know, quite critical analyses of the current radiation risk model in the peer review literature. It's getting through the peer review literature. In fact, not only that, but I'm being invited to conferences. I've been invited to write papers and more than I can possibly do, you know, I, and so I have to say no, 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 because it, it's a lot of work. I have to say, you know, it's not easy to do this stuff. You, I just funny. recently, I recently wrote a, a paper about childhood leukemia. Um, and that's hard work, you know, it took three or four weeks and then I had to send it off. The reviewers got back to me and said it's all a load of nonsense and so forth. But the editor said, no, it isn't. You have to just revise your paper. And, and this is like a lot of work, you know, it takes yeah. up a lot of time. Right. Especially if all your work gets thrown away by a reviewer. Yeah, that's right, of course. But it's increasingly being getting, getting through and being published. Good, good. All right. Well, with that in mind uh, and, uh, you know, not only your experience, but your lack of having to repeat what somebody tells you you know yes. your ability to be to say what you think um how is nuclear power produced all right well you we have to start with radiation we have we have to start with the fact that 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 there are um, unstable elements you know you know the periodic table tells us there are all these elements hydrogen helium lithium sodium potassium rubidium cesium and so on you know all this stuff and then coal, and and, uh, and just to keep this really including the people who are picking up the basics for the first time. These, yeah. ele these elements are considered to be the individual building blocks of physical matter. Correct. Uh, Every, everything, I mean, if you go back to chemistry and, 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 uh, and, you, and you look at all of the material that there is on Earth, you can, you can play with it. And, 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 of course, in the 19th century, they did do this, and they added acids to it, and they did mm. precipitated this with alkali, and they, they, they did lots of chemistry. And uh, eventually the picture appeared that there are lots and lots of different elements on Earth, but not an infinite number. There's 92 ele natural elements on Earth, and the heaviest one of these is uranium. The lightest one is hydrogen. And so the, the, there was a, there's a table called the periodic table that shows all these elements, which the very heavy ones are on the bottom right-hand side, and they've got lots and lots of electrons and lots and lots of protons, and the ones at the top 
left-hand side have only one I mean, hydrogen only has one electron and one proton. The proton is a big, fat, positively charged thing in the middle, and the electron right. is whizzing around it, and they're balanced by their electric charge. Okay? And if you go to the second element, which is helium, then you've now got... You've got, you've got two electrons and two and so on all the way up. So you keep adding protons and you keep adding electrons. Okay. Well, it turns out that some elements, the big heavy elements, are un- have, have, have versions of them which are unstable. And what these elements do is they decay. They change into something else. And when the, and they change into something else, they, they release energy. To they're losing energy. part. Is it true they're losing part of their nucleus? Yes, that's right. They, they, they lose part of their, their nucleus and then they have to rearrange their electronic structure in order to, in order to, um, because they, they, they give up, they give off energy and, and there are three types of energy that they give off. They give off gamma radiation, which is just like light, but mm-hmm. very, very powerful, dangerous light that's capable of, of causing ja- damage to, to tissue and, and breaking, breaking bonds. So that's gamma rays. And, and x-rays are the same so some of the, so they give off some of those they also give off part, big heavy particles which are like helium part helium nuclei so they go bam and off goes one of these particles which is big heavy positive doubly positively charged particle called an alpha particle and then also they give off um, electrons so you get beta radiation which is just an electron so basically these unstable molecule uh, unstable atoms of various different elements and mainly these elements are uh, for the purposes of our argument are thorium and uranium and uranium has has two versions of uranium that are important to us uh, which is most of the uranium is called uranium 238 because that's atomic weight that's that's its mass mm-hmm. and then there's a slightly lighter one called uranium 235 and the mass the mass of these things is is a function of the number of protons and neutrons and electrons that they have. You said uh, it, 235 is larger, you said? Uh, 235 is smaller. Smaller. It's okay, larger. and and one question that comes up immediately is if these natural elements are decaying and they're losing part of their nucleus over time, and they've been doing that since they started, and the Earth is really old, generally well, considered. To well, be- that, 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 that's, that brings us to the second question, the second, uh, the second argument. Yes, of course, because they're still here. Of course, the Earth is really old. I mean, the the heart that these things decay. They don't go bam and then disappear. They decay sort of um, slowly. So. Uh, and they decay exponentially. So that is to say that after after, after half half of the, their their total lifetime, half of them is there, and so on. So it's called right. half life. Right. So so if you take uranium two three eight, which is which is the main uranium isotope, ninety nine percent of uranium of uranium that you dig out of the ground is uranium two three eight. Then that one has a half life of. 4.7 billion years. So that's 4.7 times 10 to the 9. So that's 4.7 million million years, which is a very long time. Mm-hmm. So, so although it decays, it decays quite slowly. It's not, it's not something that that um, that decays in, it, it, you know, like in two seconds or in in a year or in a hundred years or anything like that. It's quite slowly decay. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any left on Earth. Of course. Well, that's why I was asking if the ones. Why are there any left on the ones that have a short half life? Well, there aren't the ones that have really short half lives Some of these, some of the decay, because this brings me to the point about when they decay, they change into something else. So, for instance, if you take uranium two three eight, we start with that. When that decays, it gives off an alpha particle, which has got f- a, 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 an atomic unit of four. So it goes from two three eight to two three four. So you've now got uranium-234, and that gives off an alpha particle over a very long time, again, okay, long half-life. And then that uh, uranium-234 eventually becomes uh, thorium-230. It goes down every four at a time, okay? And then thorium-230 decays down to radium-226. So we keep taking four off. And radium-226 decays down to ra- ra- radon-220, which is a radioactive gas. And radon-220 goes down, and there's a whole range of these things. And it doesn't always go down by four. Sometimes it changes into another element without going down at all by shooting off an electron. So it's a bit complicated, but all we need to know in in terms of talking about nuclear power and bombs is that that it can decay into something else. 
And when you uh, and to come, if we fast forward to nuclear power, when they when they sort of soup up the rate of these de de decays by putting in neutrons, which we'll come to, what happens is that they put, they split. You get uranium fission. So what happens then is rather than going down two three eight, two three four, two thirty, two two six, they go bam. And, you, and it breaks into, into lots of little bits like strontium-90 and cesium-137 and, and uh, well, I mean, there's a whole range of, range of millions of these things. And some of them are very, very short-lived. So they just go bam, and then they go into some bam, and then they go into something else, bam. And so that decay happens very, that sort of fission produces lots and lots of fission products. And some of these fission products... There's a, there's a lot of them. No, not an infinite number, but relating to uranium uh, decay, you've got things like silver and uh, mercury and, and um, cobalt and, and all sorts of isotopes that are produced. Um, so this is a form of natural alchemy that's going on. It, it is. It is. It is. But it's not natural in terms of fission because fission doesn't normally happen. In order to do nuclear fission, you've got to do something. And, and uh, what you have to do is you have to increase the 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 the, the, the percentage the, the the concentration of neutrons. And so and, there and are, new, you know, these, are are, um, these isotopes are different. These, so uranium isotopes are different because of a different number of neutrons. Okay. Now, what they discovered, what they figured out, uh, and this was this was all those people like Fermi and and uh, all the fathers Einstein and the fathers of the bomb those people, Szilard and so on, the Manhattan Project people, they, they, found, they, they figured out, they were, I think the, there was a German, uh, Meitner, uh, who, who first did fissioning in the test tube. But the point is that when, when one of these elements fissions, it produces huge amounts of energy. So Einstein and co. pointed out that, that the, the amount of energy that could be produced by causing an enormous amount of neutrons to sort to, to, of interact with the with the material all at one time would lead to a chain reaction so so one neutron would go bam into the nucleus and shoot out two neutrons and then that would produce four and that would produce eight and that would be 16 and then you know in like a microsecond there would be so many neutrons that the whole the whole mass of the material would just fly apart with enormous amounts of energy and that and only works what, with certain materials right that's your bomb that is but in order to do that you have to take the fissile component of the uranium out of it and concentrate it in order to have that sort of system. You have to, you have to extract the uranium-235 from the uranium-238. And as you can imagine, well, as you can see, 235 over 238 is a very slight difference in weight. Right. So if you want to pull the, if you want to pull the uranium-235 out, and there's not very much of it, so it's like 0.3% of it in, in, in the ore that you pull out of the ground. You're going to have okay. to have a lot of okay. lot of machines that are using centrifuges, and 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 uh, the other way they do it is by by pushing it through um, cer ceramic, you know. So so in other words, if you push it through, the lighter one goes through more easily than the heavier one, and so on. So it's you like can, a filter, is, like a filter system, basically. Yeah, lots like yeah, I was like like yeah, exactly like a ceramic pot, like a filter system, yeah. So and, there was and 238 is 238 is not radioactive, right? Sorry? 238 is not radioactive. No, no, it is radioactive, but very weakly radioactive. I see. Okay. So the heart the, it's not about anyway, it's not entirely about its radioactivity. It's about it I mean it is radioactive because they uh, they fire this stuff uh, in the Gulf War. So so in other words once they've taken the uranium 235 out, you've got the uranium 238 with less uranium 235. Right. And that turns out to be a magic bullet when it comes to shooting tanks. That's so the American de depleted uranium. Yeah, yeah, DU, depleted uranium. And so they found that if you shoot one of these things at a tank, It'll go straight through it and kill everybody inside, right. and produce produce these microparticles, these nanoparticles of uranium two three eight, and they are radioactive. Yes, they are. Okay, but just not very radioactive. But I mean, I've been in the desert in Iraq with a Geiger counter, with a scintillation counter, looking for this stuff, and also in Kosovo. I visited Kosovo with, with the with the Japanese TV people, Ch Japanese Channel 4, Nippon TV. And we spent a week there looking for depleted uranium bullets 
because the uh, NATO had said that they hadn't used depleted uranium. They were just lying, as usual. Yeah. Uh, and so the Japanese said, you know, will you come with us with some machinery and, and we're going to have a look. So we did. And we went and had a look and we found the stuff. So they had to admit that they were using depleted uranium. And lots of lots of cancers occurred as a result of all of that stuff, in, in, particularly in, in Sarajevo, where they, where they used huge amounts of uranium weaponry. You know, um, when, that, when that kind of thing happens, the, it seems like no one ever follows up. Like, go and talk to the people who were lying about it and say, let's look at what you said before and what why well, this, you were saying but this is the media i mean i certainly went to them and told them told them they're a bunch of liars you know. what was their response anything they said no we're not i mean they can do what they they, they can say what they like you know they yeah, can say right. they said that we went and looked and we didn't find anything okay. and so then i said well you didn't look properly you should have looked like this and so when i found it they had to go back this was the united nations environment program UNEP. And so they, they had to go back and do another and have another look. Uh, and then, of course, you know, once we'd shown that that was the case and we'd measured the stuff, they had to say, yes, yes, it is there, but then it doesn't cause any trouble and nobody's going to be hurt because the radiation is not very great and blah, blah, blah. Right. It's approved. So, I mean, they're like monkeys. You know, they're, they're, they're cunning. You know, they, they always have an answer. They always have an answer. But they're going to lose. I mean, at the moment, they are losing. It's quite fun. But yes, to go back. So to go back to this business of of of, uh, of the uh, neutrons, you you have these uh, you have neutrons coming off the U two three five, and if you get it, if you get them closer to closer and closer, and they're more and more and more neutrons, then each neutron will produce more neutrons. So you get this chain reaction. And you can, and if the piece of uranium that you're bringing together are big enough, you get what's called prompt crit criticality. So the thing just goes boom like that, and you get a blue flash, uh, and then you're dead. And this has actually happened by those a lot of those people working in the Manhattan Project. They did these experiments, and, and they and they died, and they died. They don't die immediately; they die within about a week. Because and that's what, what they call a chain reaction, basically. Yeah, that's right. You get you get too many neutrons, and you produce a, a kind of prompt criticality, and then you get a huge load of radiation suddenly flies off, and that's it, and and they fly into your body, and you get an enormous dose, and all your cells die. But they but they don't they don't die until they try to replicate. So that's why you don't die immediately. That's like those people from Chernobyl. You know they. They were walking around and talking and saying, oh, God, isn't it terrible and this and that. But they were all dead men walking because their cells had been killed. And, and once the cells started to replicate, they died because they didn't replicate. So all the cells fell to bits and they just had. So it, it doesn't, doesn't, stop, doesn't stop the cells living. It just means their replication is over. Yes, that's right. Well, that's the same as killing them. Yes, exactly. And when you say the radioactive element uh, shoots out neutrons, just are they still under the understanding that neutrons are one of the two elements in the nucleus? There's yes, no, that's neutrons right. And uh, protons, neutrons, so. neutrons represent the difference between you, between one isotope and another isotope with the, with the same element name. So, in other words, you 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 can have. Um, Uranium-234, uranium-236, uranium-238, uranium-235. They mm -hmm. just have different... They, the, 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 the mass number is, is different because of the different number of neutrons. That's what what makes some elements not let go of neutrons like that? There's, they're, 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 there's a, they're, they're stable. The, the, um, the, 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 uh, the composition of the nucleus is such that, that, that these elements are stable and they don't want to decay. Okay. Because they're like happy, if you like, you know, they, they yeah, have a sort yeah, of mag yeah. magic number of, of yeah. neutrons, protons. So something right. unhappy going on in the other ones. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and of course, the, the bigger they are, the more likely you are to find something that's unhappy because it's got far too many things that are all going on, I suppose. You okay. Like that. I mean, nobody really knows exactly uh, in science about, about anything, but, but we, we know enough to know. Um, well, the, the physicists know enough to know what, what, and have all sorts of explanations about nuclear stability, which I, frankly, I don't know a lot about. I have never been that interested in it. I mean, my interests are, are taking it from the element, from you know, from the radiation end of it forward mm -hmm. to seeing what it does to people. But from the point of view of nuclear bombs and nuclear power, 
uh, it, it is the neutron flux that is important. So when they when they make a nuclear reactor, you know, no, no, you know, we've got a bomb and it goes woof like that, like like at Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. Most most of the the material, most of the U two three five, does not fission because the the energy associated with the the, fish, the the stuff that does fission, you know, you. In the in the Hiroshima bomb, you had two lumps of uranium, and they shot them together with a kind of like two ca- like a cannon, and they went mm-hmm. bam like that. And then they fission, and then there was that huge explosion that everybody knows about, where you see the entire city is in ruins and blah blah. But actually, that was only five percent of the mass of uranium that fissioned. Ninety five percent of it didn't fission, and it just sort of came wow. out right, black so that, rain. And, that explosion in Hiroshima was measured in kilotons of equivalent TNT, right? Yeah, yeah, 15 kilotons associated with the fissioning of about 4% of the, of the uranium-235. In, in How the, much uranium was that required? It was about 10 kilograms. Okay, 20 pounds, 22 And pounds. that's not very much, incidentally, in terms of, of looking at it, because, because the density of uranium is 20. It's heavier than lead, yeah. It's, yeah, much heavier. It's twice as heavy. So, so if you take, I mean, if you take a kilogram, no, well, let's see, if you take an apple, but let's say if you take a, 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 hun, a hundred cc's of, of uranium, you know, like a tenth, tenth of a liter of uranium, yeah, and then you multiply that by 20, and so you, you, get, you get two kilograms, and, and this is this tiny little thing. I mean, I've picked these things up on the beach, not on the beach, in the desert in, um, in Iraq, because a lot of these bullets that they shoot from these Gatling guns on on the A10 on the Warthog, uh-huh. they just they just go into the sand, you see. And and, and and if they hit something, they burn. But if they just go into the sand, there they are. And you can find them with your scintillation counter, with your Geiger counter. You're walking along with this thing, and it suddenly starts going mad. And you and you dig around, and there they, there's one of these things. It's about the size of my finger, and it's very heavy if you pick it up. Which is not a good idea anyway, because they've got they have they, they do have beta radiation and gamma radiation as well as alpha. The alpha radiation is very short range, so it doesn't it do, and and this we'll come back to this when we're talking about this man, um, Galen Windsor. Mm-hmm. The the uh, the troops handle these uranium weapons themselves, and uh, they don't burn them. You know they they and the reason for that is that they. Is that they've got a little cadmium coating, and the and the X and the gamma rays, not the gamma rays, that the alpha particles can't get through the through the surface of this stuff, but they certainly can get get come out of the little bullets, and those those things were all over, all over Iraq. That they they used you know tons and tons and tons of these things firing them all over the place, and so the children play with them, and then of course they get burned. Um, where was I? Oh yes, nuclear power. All right. So, so, so because of the the new, the, the the massive exponential um, increase in neutrons, which results in the fissioning of of uranium two three five, with the ex- with, with that extraordinary amount of energy that comes out when you fission it, that produces the the fifteen kilotons of of, of yield in terms of explosive power in Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. Um, you can. If, it was figured out that if you could regulate that, in other words, rather than making it all go bang, you could sort of just make it get hotter and hotter and hotter. You had a way in which you could boil water. And then you could use that water in a steam turbine to, to turn turbine yeah. and make electricity. So it's it's just, just how they used to power locomotives for trains. That's because the basic, instead yeah. of coal, you use uranium. Yeah, in principle, that's right. You can, you can make a nuclear reactor, it's called... Uh, and you've got to figure out ways in which you can regulate the neutron flux, you know, so that it doesn't go mad. Uh, and so first, the first thing you have to do is you have to increase the neutron flux. So you have to, so you have to get, get you've got to slow the neutrons down um, with a mo- what's called a moderator. So it stops them going whizzing along, so they go more slowly, so that mm-hmm. they build up and 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 then you can get a lot of heat. So what you do is you take uranium pellets, about this big they are, about that big, and you put them in a tube. 
and you hang them down in water because the water moderates the neutron flux, so it reduces the, it stops the neutrons flying about the place. You want all the neutrons in one place, so you put lots of rods and you put them close to each other so that the neutron from each each rod hits the neutron hits the uranium from the other rod, and the neutron and the neutrons from that rod hits the mm. hits the uranium from the first rod, and so on. So you make a big rack of these things, and you put them in water. But you have to stop it going mad so that they explode. You want to regulate the temperature. You see, so what you do is you have um, something that you have substances which absorb neutrons, and the favourite one is boron. It's another chemical element, and it happens to happens to absorb neutrons. So what you do is you have these boron rods. So you have boron rod, uranium rod, boron rod, uranium rod, and these. But the boron rods can be pulled in and out like that. And so, as you pull them out, more mm. neutrons. As you push them down, fewer neutrons. Okay. So you don't have to change the number of boron rods. You just change the amount of disp- uh, you just that move, they're under move them up and down. Yeah, that's right. You move them up right. and down, and you have all these meters that tell you what the neutron flux is and what the end, what okay. you know, what the temperature is, and all the rest of it. Of so course, if you have a problem with the boron rods and they don't go up and down, or you know, there's some problem with yeah. them, like you get you get Chernobyl. So then you know it goes bam because right. they, they get so hot that they melt. And Fukushima as well. Once the water goes away, they get hot, they have got no cooling, and they get hotter and hotter and hotter, and then they and then they melt, and then they fall into the bottom of the reactor where they all get together like a bomb, and then they go bang. See, which is what happened in Fukushima. It's what happened in Chernobyl. They say hydrogen explosion, but both of these, both both Fukushima number one and and the other one, uh, Chernobyl, were were prompt criticalities. But anyway, so that's how you do nuclear. So then, what what? Once you, mm-hmm. what you do is you then have to take the heat away because there's all this heat, and so there are various way, methods of doing that. But the, but the, the fir- one of the first ones that was used was to use carbon dioxide, and as a moderator, you didn't have water; you had graphite, and that's that's what you had with Chernobyl. You had graphite, you had carbon blocks of carbon like that, and they had holes drilled in them, and, and the rods went up and down through the holes, mm. and it was the carbon that moderated the neutron flux. Then, but, and then you cooled them with gas, so you can push carbon dioxide through. Uh, in Chernobyl, you push water through. When, uh, in, when it's water cooled, that would produce the steam that would dry. That's the right. Air. Yeah. So, so there are two there, there are two types of water cooled. Well, I mean, they're not a fair number, but the two main ones. The first one that was was invented in America by GEC was called the boiling water reactor. So that was a really simple one. So you just put water in there and it boiled, <laughs> and then. Right. And then that the pipe came out of there and it went to a turbine and it went the turbine went round and round made electricity and then you cooled the water once it gone through the turbine and you pumped it back into the into the reactor so so right. so the water that was in contact with with the ura- with the hot uranium was the same water that turned the turbine and then more recently they have what's called a pressurized water reactor and most of the modern ones are like that PWR. So what you do there is you increase the pressure in the reactor so the water boils in the reactor at a higher temperature. Because mm-hmm. you know, if you have a high temp, if you have water at, at 130 degrees or 150 degrees, then of course it boils at a, at a higher temperature. That, that's what you do in a car engine. You you you, you screw the top on the, the radiator on cap. the radiator, and then the pressure inside the engine is it increases. So. The water doesn't boil at 100, it boils at like 120 or something like that. The older cars used to boil over all the time. Yeah, so what they do uh, with the pressurized water reactor is they take this extra hot water and they put it through a heat exchanger, so it then heats up ordinary water. Hmm. So the ordinary water then goes to the turbine and and produces all all, all the electricity. But there's no connection between the the hot, the electric, you know, the the radioactive water, if you like to call it that, right, and, and the non-radioactive water that turns the turbine. So if you, if you uh, replace the water with carbon in the other system, carbon doesn't boil very well. So, so how do you... Well, no, but you have, water, you have water in it as well. This is the oh, RNBK. Yeah, this, is, this is the... Uh, there are two types of the carbon-moderated reactors. One is a, the, the British one. It's called Magnox. And that just cooled the, the fuel elements with carbon dioxide. So you get you pump carbon dioxide, which is a gas, through this system, and right. it comes out the other side. And then you use the hot carbon dioxide to boil water in a different in a I different see. different okay. um, tank, if you like to see it like that. Okay. 
So they so are you have tubes. You have tubes like this, and the carbon dioxide goes through the tubes and boils the water in, uh, in a in a separate yeah. container. And but in the, in the Russian one, the, the water is in contact with the with the carb with the with the carbon blocks. And they've got various backup systems in case something doesn't work the way it's supposed to. To try the to whole, the, all, all they have them, and they also produced things which were which were sodium cooled, and they're, now they're talking about making a lead cooled one, and they have ones that are cooled with molten salts. You know, they're, they're various various um, models. All of them, I have to say, are very dangerous. All of them, right. because right. this stuff is horrifyingly radioactive, and if it comes out. Uh, out into the local community, even to a slight extent, it causes increases in cancer, which is what I do. I, I study the locals. And uh, but if it goes off bang, you know, like with Chernobyl, then then it contaminates the entire biosphere uh, or Fukushima as well, and then the cancer rate just goes goes up and up and up and up, and not just cancer rate, but fertility loss and congenital malformations and. And that's what happened at Fuk that was Fukushima. That will have happened, but we don't know because it, because nobody can get hold of the data. And also, it's okay. very difficult to do epidemiology in these situations because people leave. You know, you have to have a population that reasonably stable right. in order to know in order to know the the reason why something goes wrong. You know, so I mean, after Chernobyl, there was nobody nobody in the, in the close area. And um, the, the the cloud went all over the place, and some places got a lot of radiation, some places got less radiation, and so on. So it's quite hard to do that uh, that that stuff. But I'm not, although I have just done one, I've just just sent off a public a, a journal article about about Scotland and Wales because I mean, one thousand eight hundred miles away from Chernobyl, and when it rained, I was there. When it rained. The rain was radioactive because of cesium-137 and iodine-131 and various fission products that had been released when the reactor exploded. So and someone was expecting that and measured the rain, I guess. Yeah, I know, I know. that. that it, and this stuff all fell down. In fact, it was only discovered because, because some hospital in England, the Charing Cross Hospital, had various Geiger counters because they do a lot of radi radi radiology, and and somebody noticed that the, that the the meter was going through the roof, hmm. and uh, they called the government, and the government said, "And we don't know what's going on," and so on. And then there was a report from Sweden, from Stockholm too. They had a lot of a lot of radioactive rain there as well. But anyway, it caused a, it caused a significant increase in childhood leukemia in in Scotland and Wales. It, it did do that. Right, and it's been covered up. When their initial explosion happens in the plant, what exactly is exploding? Because it, what it, you know, you can have explosions that are water explosions, basically, when you va vaporize the water too fast. But you're talking about something different than that. Yes, guess, right? yes. Well, the, the 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 argument was that um, that it was a, a hydrogen explosion. Uh, and hydrogen has to come in touch with oxygen, and we all know it goes bang, okay, um, to produce water. Right. But some, but some Russians who were working up, where was it? Up, up uh, near St. Petersburg, I think. And there were also some Nor Norwegian people who were measuring the fission products that came out of the Chernobyl uh, explosion. And there were some. Some of these were, were gaseous fission products called xenon. That there was a that there's a, there are a number of xenon xenon is a is a noble gas and and uh, it has a number of isotopes but if you measure the ratio of the isotopes of xenon 131 and xenon 133 i think it tells you whether there was a a, a critical bomb type explosion mm -hmm. because uh, and and that's what they found that it was a critical bomb type explosion because otherwise, if it was just hydrogen a hydrogen explosion, then the then the concentrations of of xenon isotopes would be those that you would normally find in a reactor, and it wasn't like that. So this and was then, a version of what happened in Hiroshima, right? Yeah. Where where the two different, more than two, but different sources of these neutrons ran into each other and caused the chain reaction. That yes, that's explosion. right. That's right. That's right. They melted. That's right. what happened. They melted. They got so hot that they melted, and when they melted, of course, you know the the, the the mass of the material got sufficiently great for there to be a critical explosion. The same thing happened in 1957 in Kishtim, in uh, in Russia, where they had a, a spent fuel tank. 
which exploded. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it communicated radioactivity to about 700 square kilometers. What they call the, if you look at, if you like that, at Tarkovsky, there's a film called Stalker in which this guy goes into the zone. And that, that is the zone. Kishtim is still contaminated. People can't go there. Same as Chernobyl, that zone. That's another zone where people can't go there or, or you, get, you, you, you die. You have a higher risk of cancer. I mean, you can survive, if it, but, but you don't know that you can survive. It's just entirely statistical. This is what we right, call statistics. Right. So people are asking why do they let people back into Fukushima, into, uh, sorry, I guess it was Fukushima that they were asking. Yes, about. yes, yeah. Because people live there, right? And, and they even use the farm products and stuff like yes. that. Yes, that's because they believe in this risk model that, they, that they've developed in order to, to save in order to save the nuclear industry and the military ability to use radioactivity. It's, it's, a, it's a scandal. It's a public health scandal. And it is, it's, it's what I, it's my, if you like, it's my project. It's what, I, it's what I've done since, since about 1990, is to draw attention to the wor- of the world to the fact that the, the, the calculations that they have relating to the exposure of people in Fukushima or Chernobyl or near Sellafield or whatever mm-hmm. are bogus. And they're just there with a load of dishonest scientists who produce this stuff in order to justify the continuing use of, of, uh, of, of nuclear reactors and, and nuclear bombs and depleted uranium and all the rest of it. The uh, problem with that is that once you've shown that to be the case, Normally, you would think, okay, well, they'll just change the policy right away, you know, because well, what right. you've shown is clear. Yeah. I'm afraid that, that, that it, you know, it's just, it just doesn't work, doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. They, they just ignore it. Although it's increasingly difficult to do that. I've, I've only really got a foot through the door in the last five years, I guess, and mostly as a result of court cases. Because mm. if you go, if you the point is, if you go into a court case, especially if you've got a jury, and you can get to a judge who is reasonably honest, and not all of them are, right? Then, then you can you can get the you can win the case. And so the, 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 all the, so if you come in with a with a scientific report like these ones that I produce, and if you produce the report for a specific individual that the case is about, then you win the case. Uh, and so increasingly they're going to have to do something about this. I think what they probably will do is they'll just have to concede that using nuclear power uh, is necessary and that, it, and that people dying is going to be like a co- collateral damage, you know, a bit like driving cars. And if you drive cars on the roads, then some people are going to get killed because they have car accidents. Yeah. It's going to be like that. I, I should think that's probably what they'll do. Yeah, because in these court cases... I would imagine that you're typically asking for compensation for a victim. Yeah, we get it too. We get vast amounts. And you get it, but that doesn't, it's not a court case against the uh, person who who set up the plant. No, it is. It is. It is usually a court case exactly against the people who are doing the contamination. But what they do is they buy you off before you get to the jury. So what they do, you know, so you've got Joe Bloggs and he worked for this company uh, and, and got irradiated as a result of working for some nuclear plant or something. And right. now, he's, now he's like 52 and he's got colon cancer, okay? Yeah. So he's, he's suing GEC or whoever it is the plant uh, uh, owners are or the, the people who are, are at fault. He's suing them for a lot of money. Let's say, let's say 20 million, right? Okay. Um, and he gets it. So what? They, so once they once they figured out that they're going to lose the case, they start off by fighting you, and they bring in all their all their experts, and their experts say, "Oh no, it can't possibly have happened," and blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then once they realise that you can go into court and you can persuade the, ju- the 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 jury that you're right, then they say, "Okay, well, we'll give you ten million." Uh, and you say, "No, we want twenty million." They say, "Okay, we'll give you fifteen million, but you're not allowed to say anything about this." Yeah, that's the condition. Yeah. Now, when you're in court on a case like that, years after the fact, when the cancer has developed, how can you prove that there was no other factor that could have caused it? You have to do that. You have to do that. You have to persuade the jury. 
and you have to say, well, you know, the, this this amount of dose can cause the cancer. Okay. Uh, the cancer came on quite early, so it's unusual. So you, you can look at the rates of cancer in people and say that at the age of 52, this guy was very unlikely to get cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, if he'd been an ordinary member of the population, his probability of getting cancer, you can work this out, is like you know one in 500 or something right uh, and so and but he worked for this plant and he got this sort of dose and he might have got that sort of dose so as a result of inhaling whatever it was he inhaled okay. um the the actual dose of the tissue as a result of his inhalation was enormously big and on the basis of the current risk model on that basis you can say yeah. that it's more more probable that, than not you know that he got cancer as a yeah. result overwhelmingly exposure. likely yeah yeah you That's don't right. have to prove that it's impossible that you have to prove 50 50 percent is the limit is your limit you have to okay. prove, you, you have to you have to prove that it's that it's more possible than more likely than not right that the cancer was caused by his previous exposure to radiation okay 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 so nuclear power carries these unavoidable dangers in the in the process right yeah and you're saying eventually the companies may just have to admit they're willing to take the risk yes yes uh, they, they they're not prepared to go into court and lose right right and they're very rich people you know they're like the, the people that that these uh, lawyers that i work for go after are not poor you're talking about boeing i mean i did one case uh, was the santa susana Research Laboratory, SSFL, mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, Los Angeles, in the Simi Hills. And there were some children there who di died of, there were, I think, nine children. There were a number of children, little little children who had no eye, eyes. They had an eye cancer called retinoblastoma. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how did they get that? And right. they're saying that it was it was caused by Rocketdyne, which is the company but, uh, that that ran that operation in the Simi Hills. Uh -huh. uh, and um, Rocketdyne is own, owned by Boeing, you know. So we're talking big mm. money there. These people right. have got a lot, a lot of money. Okay. Right. And so then I, I was asked to say, how could this have happened? And what I figured out was that there was a, a remediation that took place in the 1990s. Um, I'm not. I'm not supposed to talk about this incidentally, but I don't give a damn because I didn't write. I didn't sign anything. Okay, so, um, and we won the case, lots of millions. You know, right, right. Um, so, what happened was that in the 1990s, everybody around there was complaining about the amount of of radiation that had been coming out of this plant because they were they were complete nutcases. These people they were making rocket engines and they wanted to make rocket spaceships and rocket helicopters and no re nuclear nuclear spaceships everything run by nuclear it was dan dare yeah it was it was sort of like you know superman stuff yeah yeah because uh, all the the early radiation people were like that they that you know they looked at all those comics and you know the incredible hulk and yeah. all that sort of shit you know and they they sort of got money from the government to make all this nonsense okay and they produced yeah. all these weird reactors they said oh let's try this no no let's try that oh let's have a sodium cooled reactor and so on yeah okay? and and there was an explosion in the 60s there was a the so the so their, their sodium cooled reactor exploded and, and everything went all over the place of course they covered it up um it went all over los angeles and everything so anyway the, the population of los angeles was getting a bit pissed off at this right. so they they thought they they got enough power into the legislature to force them to remediate the site so they had to dig all this radioactive shit out put it on lorries and drive it off to uh, to the nevada test site and dump it there you know and, yeah and so they did that but in order to do that I had to drive these lorries through los angeles you know because that's where the road went you know, yeah. right. and also and also in order to dig this stuff up they they used they they had to dynamite all the all the um uh buildings so they'd be like the the extremely dangerous radioactive building 14 you know and right. they had to take it away so what they had to do is blow it up you see and then put it all on trucks and take it away because when they blew it up all the dust went all over the place right. blew all over los angeles and um there is no luckily luck, unluckily for them they measured this stuff in various filter apparatuses that they, they've been forced to put around the site you see and so uh, i i got hold of all this data all the actual measurements that they'd made of the stuff in the filters 
And I was able to show that they that, that actually, because they said in their reports, they would say there's a lot of natural uranium in the area, you see, but actually it wasn't yeah. natural uranium, it was U-235, it was the fissile uranium. Yeah. See? So that's my that was my big discovery. Then I plotted the U two three five in the filters, and it happened to fit exactly in the in the in with, with the numbers of children that got this eye cancer. You see, and that was oh. it; they finished. Oh. So they just got oh. the checkbook out at that point. Incredible. So what have any any? I mean, I'm I'm watching our time because I know you have to go. But what about observations of what? Uh, G- Galen Windsor was saying. Oh yeah, Galen Windsor. Well, there's one interesting point about that, which I'll say, is that there's a, there is a range of of uh, uh, sensitivity to radiation, right? Among so different people. Th- yeah, different people have different sensitivities to radiation. Okay. But even more than that, um, there was there's been work in the '90s carried out on what's called genomic instability. So uh, originally it it was thought, um, one of the early theories was that radiation causes cancer by causing genetic mutation Mm -hmm. in in the DNA. And that is true. But um, the the, the amount of genetic mutation is is not really enough to account for the cancers. So in the 90s, they discovered that that if you get exposed to radiation, it, it causes your cells to automatically generate mutations that are not related to the, the radiation except sort of implicitly. So in other words, well, not in other words, but what they discovered was that if you fire some radiation at one set of cells, then you get a mutation in cells that are nowhere cl- not close to the, the, the ones that you've attacked. There's some signaling wow. that goes on. Wow. They just don't know what that is. No, they, they haven't figured out what the signaling is, but there is signaling. I've got, I've got a good idea myself, but, but this is a different subject. Um, so what, what, what is important for Galen Windsor here, for my argument there, is that it turns out that about one-fifth of the population, about one in five, that when their DNA gets damaged by radiation or by anything, the cells do not try to replicate, do not try to re- repair themselves. Because it it's been known since, since the 60s that when a cell is damaged, the DNA repairs itself by copying it off the other strand. And then right. so the daughter, the daughter cells then have repaired DNA. Okay? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but actually, um, it turns out that about one in five people, uh, when their DNA is damaged, the cell commits suicide. So it doesn't attempt to replicate. It says, okay, forget it. That's it. I'm dead. Right. Now, now, those people more or less are safe from radiation, except that the radiation kills them because the cells are dead, all right? So they die young. But they don't go on to get cancer because they don't get they, – they, their cells don't um, develop these DNA. The uh, mutations DNA. don't spread in their body. That's right. You don't get the two, four, eight. 16 clone, right. clonal expansion of, of the of the da- of the damaged cell so, so you figure he was an extreme example of that well there are other people there was a there's a there was a guy called walter something or another up in sellafield who used to used to eat plutonium as well um and so yeah he probably is that is what he is but but i mean uh so what the point the point about about epidemiology is you can't do epidemiology with one person Right. My mother, for example, smoked cigarettes like, you know, a packet a day. Yeah. All, all her life. And she didn't get lung cancer. You know? Whereas other people, they smoke and they get lung cancer. Right. There, there's a big variation in the ability of, of uh, cells to, to respond to stress. Uh, and the, so the only way that you, you can approach the idea of does exposure to X produce that why is to look at large populations so you have right. to look at like you know 5000 people and then you say well these 5000 people were exposed to radiation and these 5000 people are not exposed to radiation and the ones who were exposed to radiation have like a doubling of the risk yeah. of breast cancer you know right. and then that right. tells you that radiation causes a doubling of the risk in breast cancer but it doesn't tell you whether your mother is going to get breast cancer right or, or that not. everybody will yeah and so that's called a, that's called a stochastic risk it's a it's a probabilistic risk right so when he was saying that 
it was safe for him to not only eat the uh, the uranium and plutonium, but also swim in that pool of spent waste. Oh yes, right? well, and, well, and drink well, the water. In fact, swimming in the pool of spent waste was not as bad as it sounds. Really, I mean, because the alpha emitters from the if if the, if the alpha emitters from this stuff and the gamma rays and so on, they don't really get out of the out of the pond to a very large extent. So if he's in the top of the pond and this stuff's in okay. the bottom of the pond, his yeah. dose isn't so enormous. And then these these substances that he was holding and so on, these are alpha emitters, and so the alpha alpha particles can't go through the skin, right? Mm -hmm. So then the other thing he does is he eats some uranium powder. Well, if that was pure uranium powder, the fact is that it would have just gone through him because. Like he said, uranium is not soluble in acid, uh -huh. and, and it would have traveled through his system really quite quickly. Okay. So it's, it's not such an enormous thing, although, I mean, I have to say, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's not good. It's not a good health advice to do that. <laughs> um, the other thing that he said from that, he was saying that the uh, spent so-called spent waste was referred to as an inventory by the plant and that it was worth a lot of money. And that it could be reused for something else. Is, is that true, or is it just totally to throw it's, away? It's not. It's not really true. It, I mean, it could, in principle, be used, re reused for various things, but it's so ferociously radioactive that the people right. who were working with it would be would would all be having very high levels of cancer and other illnesses. Yeah, totally impractical. Yeah. Okay. So, as a bottom line, what you found is all downside from nuclear power and obviously downside from nuclear bombs. And so That's I would, ima would imagine that, um, and in fact, right, right now in, in history, it's a really relevant time because it appears to me anyway, and to a lot of other people that NATO is really trying to start nuclear war over Ukraine and maybe uh, Kal Kaliningrad as well. Um, so that's that's a serious issue. It's not a fake. It's uh, a very problem. serious issue. It's a very very serious issue. And the, the main problem is that they think they can win a nuclear war because they've yeah. got this stupid stupid model which tells them that they might be able to, and that if they all go and hide, and of course some will survive if they have one. Uh, I have to say that I'm not persuaded by the by the nuclear winter argument. I, I think that I don't think that's 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 correct. I think those nuclear winter people are wrong. Their calculations are wrong. I don't think there will be a nuclear winter if there's a, a nuclear exchange. But what they will be is more of the same. So at the moment, we've already had, in terms of nuclear uh, pollution, we've already had World War Three. Right. I mean, enough bombs have been exploded in the atmosphere, and you know enough shit has been transferred into the into the biosphere from all the various nuclear reactors and hand. And, and, and starting in the you know, 50s basically. rocky flats and through and all that stuff you know right, to right. have already caused a, an increase in cancer in human populations from like one in nine to one in two right and a reduction in fertility so that children are not you know healthy children are no longer being born it's the worst public health scandal in human history and they still go on with this stuff you know and you get idiots like this now Galen Windsor, you know, talking complete nonsense on the basis of no knowledge. In the U.S., we have stories all the time by really hopeful people telling the truth. So-and-so official got caught doing this. Well, yeah, but th nothing happens. They no. just get more authority yeah. after that. Mm. The, yeah. wor the world is completely out of, it's bizarre, man. I mean, especially yeah. the, the, Amer the American domination of the, of the news and the media is now on the level of farce. Yeah, um, this, except it's, 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 not, it's not funny, though. No, it's not funny. It's, it's very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous, you know, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping to heaven that, that Putin continues to remain cool. And, that, and that's about the only is, person who's showing that at the moment. He's about the only only guy who's showing any sort of sense in all of this. Right? Yeah, exactly. But I have to say that Kaliningrad, they backed off today. I, I hear that the EU is now backing off. Kaliningrad is just down the road here. You know? just, I know, I know, I know. So they're saying, well, maybe too many people heard about this. So it would be they're too backing off. Yeah, the EU it would be is too saying obvious that the EU was the start of the war. Sorry? 
it would be too obvious that the EU caused the yes, war. Yes, yes, yes. And also, but the other point about that, of course, is the EU ultimately is sitting right on top of, of Kaliningrad, where there's a lot of nuclear missiles. Yeah, so it would be you know, inconvenient for their offices, right? Yeah. So they could, they could pop a missile into Berlin with no difficulty at all. Yeah, yeah. The Russians have said that um, right now it would take about four of their missiles to wipe out the major cities in the U.S. So. Yes. Yes, that's right. I mean, there's a very interesting book. I mean, I didn't talk about the bomb. There's another sort of bomb. Like in the bombs I'm talking about when I was discussing bombs was uh, I was talking about uranium bombs, which which are fission bombs. But they're there. But nowadays, everyone uses fusion bombs, which is a much much more powerful thing, where you fuse hydrogen into helium, and and, and you get much more bang for your buck. Is that the same as what they call a he a hydrogen bomb? Yes, yes, hydrogen bomb. That's right. And that's yeah. why hydrogen, as compared to what they used to call atomic. Yeah. It's a lot worse because yes, that's, that's right. Fusion fusion. Bomb. What, what happens with that is that they 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 have put hydrogen in the bomb, a form of hydrogen anyway. Uh -huh. Lithium, it's a deuterium. It's lithium deuteride that they they use now. And then the, the, what you, what happens is they have a kind of fission component of the bomb that squeezes this down into a very small thing, and then when it gets really really concentrated in the middle, you, the the the, heat, the the hydrogen turns into helium, and then you get a massive amount of energy comes out. So these things are about two hundred. One of these warheads, um, the Russian warheads, if you like, the ones that yeah. are small, small enough to go on the missiles. Will pack about two hundred kilotons. All right, so hot, so he, you know, in terms of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, where you've got like fifteen kilotons, yeah. one of these one of these beasts will 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 pop out two hundred kilotons. Right, so if one of those things drops in Manhattan, you can say goodbye to New York, just right. one, just yeah. one, and they yeah. and they and they're now on missiles that go so fast. These sort of hypersonic missiles that yeah, they can they be there before be anybody can detect them. So the next thing you know is bang. Yeah, and it's minutes. They yeah they can go across the world in a very short time. Uh, yeah, the the only countermeasure really to stop that from happening at some point, since you've got all these fallible humans involved, is um, a change in consciousness for the population. Well, we've been thinking about that since the 60s, and no, nothing's happened. I mean, I'm unfortunately, the, the, the young people nowadays, have, uh, uh, they're, not, they're not, I don't know if they're not interested, but they, they don't understand the... the, the well, they've been educated, you know. They don't understand the existential danger. I mean, it, it's just truly, truly no. all, uh, appalling, you know, what can happen. Like, like, this is New York, now it's gone. That's it. No, the fast food places and the movies on TV are still operating. So it must all be fine. I know, I know. Anyway, I mean, I, you know, people like us bleed away, and maybe it makes a difference. And then, and then we've got to do it, I suppose. Anyway, I mean, otherwise, got to don't. do, got to do what? We've got to bleed away and tell them, <laughs> tell them not to do it. Tell oh. them it's really bad, you know, and that there's and then risk model is wrong, and they're killing people, and they have killed people. And yeah, and then the what to do about it? One of the main problems with that is that a component of the brainwashing that's going on globally coordinated is to make sure that if people find out about a problem, they start to believe in the wrong solution that actually makes the problem worse. And the whole environmental movement has been subject to that. Then I know. Well, the trouble is, since, since Monbiot, that the, they're all arguing that we should, we need nuclear now because we've the tr the trouble is that nobody seems. To, I mean, I was in the Green Party when it started, and at that time, we we recognised that we live on. If you like to think about it in this way, we live on a spaceship, spaceship yeah. Earth. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that what we have on this to keep us alive is limited. We have only got a certain amount of oil, certain amount of gas, certain amount of this, certain amount of that. But but the problem with, with if you like the capitalist system, the, this the, the the you know the system of the West, the West, sure. is that is that what they want to do is just piss all this stuff up the wall in order to become rich. And and what's the point of being rich? Are they happy? They're not happy. None of them are happy. All the people I know who are rich are mostly are, are, are like desperately unhappy. But all they try to do is tread on. And then they teach this in the universities. They call it business studies, you know. Yeah, and the I business know. and the business study tells you 
you, you, you get to be a master of business administration. Well, what yeah. that means is that you tread on somebody's face and steal their wallet. Effectively, that's what yeah. it is. And you find more and more sophisticated ways of doing it. But at the end of the day, nobody gains because you've had to rip all this stuff out of the ground and there's no more left. I actually went through that program. And yeah. um, what you learn, you know, just to make it more complete picture, is that if the fines and penalties are less than the profit, then it's reasonable business. And you have to evaluate it carefully that way to make sure you're not losing more than the profit. So, but, but I did find out that where these destructive orders are coming down from that translated into global agendas, at that level, it's not about money at all. They already control all the money. And they just use the money motivation for the lower managers, corporate heads and people like that, who think that they're going to escape the results somehow. But the other question that comes up, I just remembered um, about the nuclear uh, explosions, is that you look at places like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where everybody's living, Fukushima, where the farmers are operating and selling their produce and all that. If you were going to make that a safe policy, how long would you have people stay out of a place like Fukushima or Nagasaki and, and why? Okay. Um, well, the the answer is, I guess the I, I guess like ten years. Ten. I mean, you would still have a lot of radioactivity there, but but the point is that just like in Iraq, um, the radioactivity goes away because of weathering, because the rain falls and it washes down to the sea, and it slowly kind of like calms down, if you like. So it's not and just it, a half life issue. No, it's not a half-life issue. It's a, it's a kind of environmental um, movement issue. The ha the half-life is still there. You know, I mean, the, the if you take the main the long-lived the two main long-lived isotopes, the strontium ninety and cesium one three seven, they have a half-life of thirty years. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you if, if they all fell on the surface of the ground at Fukushima and there they are, then in thirty years' time, there would the amount of radiation coming from them would be fifty percent. Okay. Right. Right. And then in another in another thirty years, it would be another another fifty percent, be down to twenty five percent, and so on, and then then twelve percent, and and so forth. But of course, they're being taken away all the time physically by the rain, and the rain washes them into the ground, and it washes them into the rivers, and then the rivers carry them out into the sea, where they where they combine with the sediment on the coasts, mm -hmm. and so that and so that, and then the fish eat them, and then it gets into the. All, you know, all the seafood and, and all that yeah, stuff. Food chain. Um, right. But there's not much you can do about that. So by the time, I would say by about 10 years, it would still be a dangerous place to live, but, but you know, much less dangerous. And of course, you've got to live somewhere and you've got to consider where are these people going to live? You know, the, the thing is that, that the, they then have to find enough money and, and, and live a sort of life where they can be comfortable in Osaka, say, but then as a result of being poor in Osaka because they can't get any work or because, right, they can, right. or, you know, then they're going to die for some other reason. See, it's, it's a very complicated ecological question. So there are social and economic reasons why you yeah. can't just evacuate because yeah, exactly. Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the 40s were hit with the bombs. And you would say that ideally, if there were no logistics issues, you would have had people stay out of those cities for 10 years. Yes, I would certainly have done that. And in fact, I've argued that in a scientific paper. I mean, as a result of staying in the ruins and working in the ruins of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those people had a, a, about a 50% excess risk of cancer, even if they didn't get, even if they were not there when the bomb exploded, just as a result right. of the contamination. Right, right. And when you're talking about what to do instead of nuclear power, if you were in charge, you know, one of the things that I talked about um, taking over the so-called environmental movement and making it counterproductive by infiltrating it with the wrong motives. And one of the things our government in the U.S. is doing now is coming out with this uh, talking point. Oh, we're just doing a transition to clean energy. And they intend to shut down the economy and starve everybody, which they're actually doing now. They've cut off all the conventional energy and they're doing more. But they know that the current state of solar and wind would never take it over and it won't keep the diesel engines running. The real alternative energy 
has come out, some of it, and the people who bring it out get killed because they are a threat to the conventional energy system. One of those was uh, demonstrating uh, hydrolysis of water into hydrogen with oxygen as a waste product coming out of tailpipe. And there was a guy that drove a, a car all over the U.S. demonstrating it before he got killed. And there was somebody doing that same technology with patents and everything recently in a northeast city and he was killed by uh, an apparently crazy person in a grocery store so there is alternative energy that could fully take over but that's not allowed at this point i i, I have a different take on this i, what do you, what I do mean think? i've had to deal with this question for 30 years since i joined the green party and started and i and, and i i I was a speaker on technology in the Green Party. The real answer is, is, is one that follows from thermodynamics. The, fa the fact is that we just spend too much energy on wasteful and pointless operations. Okay? I mean, there, there, is enough, there is enough energy to keep going with conventional, conventional production of energy. But, we, but what we do is we have millions of cars driving about, taking produce on, and, and lorries take, and trains and aeroplanes and so on, taking produce halfway around the world just so that somebody can sit and eat a, a mango, you know. I, I mean, the, I, when I was in Africa in about 10 years ago, uh, uh, looking, looking at uranium mining, there was a there's a there was this huge town on on the shores of Lake Naivasha uh, that grew roses, right in Africa, and the people are starving in Africa, but these people are growing roses, and the roses are put on airplanes and flown to Europe. And exactly. if you go to little shops in Europe, you go to supermarkets in Europe, you'll find these roses. It'll be green ones and red ones and blue ones, not really beautiful right. roses. Okay, yeah, yeah. the amount of energy involved in that, so that somebody can get rich. Is, is 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 very big and, and it's unnecessary we can all be happy right. and, and we can all live happily without all of the wasteful use of energy that there is although having said that now the problem that we have now with global warming is serious because like if you take somewhere like arizona where the temperatures are are, are just unable you are unable to live there like 40 degrees for 45 degrees celsius you know, they have to have air conditioning or they die. And it so still they makes have to have energy to keep, the, to, to keep the temperature down. It still makes a gigantic difference to do what you just said, which is have local centered, more self-sufficient communities. Yes, yeah, of course. Gr growing food locally that's needed. And I think yes, you're, absolutely, you're, you're completely right. And don't waste money by manufacturing idiotic things that you sell to one another. That's not the rose grower getting rich. That's the corporation that's running the whole thing. Okay. Right. Okay. The rose grower is probably be, the people. Oh, yeah, no, work. the rose grower. The rose grower, rose grower has just got his head above water. I mean, that's, yeah, how it exactly. works. that's how the global capitalist system works, you know, is they go wherever they can go to, to, to make whatever it is for as little amount of money so they can, like your business studies guy tells you, you know, they can be an entrepreneur. So they get between some yeah. poor guy and some rich guy and they screw the, the poor guy and, and, and then sell the stuff to right. the rich guy for a load of money and run off with the boodle. They, they lost that little extra detail. I think it's called ethics or morality. Or yeah, something. okay, nobody's got that anymore. The, the, no. Nobody has an internal moral compass, or at least very few people do. Yeah, I think that's near the center of the issue because you know, a choice of technologies and how to use them comes from that. So that, that's why I was saying it's a consciousness issue. Yeah. Okay. Go but, along with that. Uh, yeah. So at least we went through the basics. You know, I kept you a little bit too long. I'm sorry about that. But um, people can understand how these things are produced, how the technology works. I hope so, yeah. And that radiation is a serious issue. It's not being faked. No, it's the serious issue. It's the serious issue. More people have died from cancer and other diseases as a result of the, the, the radiation released to the biosphere since 1945 than in all of the wars in the whole of human history. It's a serious, serious thing. It's like the serious, serious thing. You're saying more people have died of cancer than directly in wars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. 
I mean, I did I did a calculation on this in in two thousand and three for for the European Committee on Radiation Risk, and we we figured out that more than sixty five million people had died of cancer between the releases uh, to the to the atmosphere from the nuclear testing between nineteen fifty and nineteen sixty five. Right, sixty million people. And you know, uh, you can tell it's a consciousness issue on two levels. One is the people memorizing in school what's true and learning not to question anything that the authorities say. And the other is the people who are originating the material that is memorized. And those are coming from a really different place. For example, cancer is one of your main focuses. And you're really looking at, you know, what that reflects being. It's because you can measure it. That's all. You, that's you, right. you know, it's, it's easy to me- it's easy to measure. Well, it's been demonstrated also, and I'm not expecting anyone to believe me, but I don't have any motive to lie about it. And for a long time, cancer has been successfully cured with no side effects, negative side effects at all, which should be a definition of real medicine. And the people that do that get harassed and raided and shut oh, yes, down yes. or ever killed. Yeah, sure. No, I know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not only interested in where it comes from, but I'm also interested in curing it. I've, I've done a lot of research on, on, on how to cure cancer. There are various ways in which you can do it. Yes. But in fact, I believe I cured the cancer of my, my, my boss um, using, yeah. using, anyway, we weren't we going. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to say, say things like that. No, uh, on, on our stations, you can. But mm. if you ever have time, look, Everybody look at a, uh, a man named Rudolf Bruce, B-R-E-U-S-S. And there's uh, two books connected with that that deserve a lot of attention. One is the Bruce Cancer Cure, and the other is the Bruce Cancer Cure Correctly Applied. Okay. Okay, I'll because at least there are countermeasures. Now, Bruce was curing lots and lots. I mean, tens of thousands of people used his method to cure incurable cancer. Doctors are trained to say what's incurable, you know. And I'll, I'll check it out. So, so he was arrested. He was arrested, of course, to keep us safe. And this was in Austria. And he was taken to court. And the, they didn't think it through very well because the court was packed with his cured patients. But they, still, they still could have uh, put him in prison. But they really blew it because the judge was one of the patients. Uh-huh. And, and they yeah. let him out. So he was able to keep doing this. The other, the second book that I mentioned, The Bruce Cancer Cure Correctly Applied. This is a story of somebody who had advanced prostate cancer and what he did with the Bruce method. Really interesting. I just want to leave us with some kind of positive, you know, yeah. hint. Of, there are things we can do okay. while we're working on the global consciousness. So anyway, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, finding an expert who is not devoid of ethics and compassion and morality and humanity is challenging, but I'm glad they're not all gone. So hold on, we'll say goodbye in the break here. There goes Dr. Christopher Busby. And as I said last time he was on, which was not that long ago, I really appreciate scientists or, you know, people in any profession or part of life, farmers or delivery drivers or anybody that is doing their work, especially people in science and doctors that have not lost their humanity and their sense of ethics. And, you know, I I think the negative things that Dr. Busby was saying about capitalism is primarily because capitalism has lost what should have been its obvious component of morality and ethics. Trying to make money, I don't see that as a bad thing at all. I obviously haven't done it yet, but um, there are people that have, and I think the making the money can be great. I don't see liking money as any problem at all, provided that you refuse to do anything for money or any other reason that it is uh, unethical. I mean, if it's by mistake, everybody makes mistakes. But if you know that you're killing people and you're doing that for money, that gives a bad name to capitalism. But the real problem is the lack of morality. Otherwise, money can do a lot of really great things. And there are ways to make money, I'm sure, uh, promoting health and energy systems that, that don't pollute and 
things that don't have negative side effects that are bad. So I, I would agree with Dr. Busby 100% in the critical importance of taking care of the environment. I think that's really and should be super obvious to any of us who still have any common sense, and hopefully we have some left. Uh, to not take care of your life support system is not brilliant. All right, so that's obvious. But our current government is saying, take care of the environment by giving up all your freedom. That is a scam, and nobody should fall for that. That's what gives environmentalism a bad name. Um, I mean... Arizona, I, I don't notice the signs of global warming. I'm sorry if that makes me an outcast, but um, I don't think the global warming is the issue that we're told it is because where those figures come from is adjusted sources. That's a polite way of saying fabricated or altered. And, you know, we don't have to worry about that as much as find energy sources that are clean, not just solar and wind, but the real ones that are being suppressed, release those, stop the insane, well, malicious spraying of the atmosphere with anything from the high level jets and even other levels. Some of them fly lower and they're dumping different recipes of all kinds on uh, the world. And it's, it's not to uh, preserve the integrity of the weather. It's to do the opposite. Because if you, if you uh, freak out and, and panic about global warming or climate change or global cooling or whatever you want to be terrified of, then the rulers figure you're more apt to give up your rights and freedoms. And even if global warming were really severe and it were happening and, you know, by now the polarized caps would be gone and what was predicted before it happened, what the founders of America realized that has been largely forgotten is that you can't give up your freedom no matter what happens. But if you have to combine that with a benevolent motive to help humanity, because we're all tied together, so we don't use energy sources that are destructive, as not by cutting them off before we have an alternative, like the US and other governments are doing now, but you look for a better alternative and then do a real transition, not the one Biden is talking about which is to shut down the economy. But a real transition, get back the water hydrolysis technology that can run internal combustion engines, stop killing the people that are have that technology to share. Same thing with the generation of electric power from fixed magnet uh, technology and other zero-point technology that's been proven. Stephen Greer has talked a lot about that. His videos explaining it are pretty long, but they're worth seeing. And there's a lot of them that we posted and you can look him up. He's still on YouTube and um, the alternative technology, not the archaic version of solar and wind that we have now, but the really effective alternative technology has already been perfected. It's just being kept out of circulation. That needs to be solved. You know, the, the issues here are not technical ones, their human issues and the fact that all of this suppressive uh, program to stop the real technologies is not about money. It's something much higher level and that needs to be reversed. And there are ways to work on that. But even though I don't agree with AOC, everybody being dead in 12 years for the reasons that she said, you know, that the climate is going to kill us the people in charge may succeed in exterminating life, which is their program for the planet. And that needs to be reversed. And the only real, potentially totally effective countermeasure that I can see at the moment has to do with change of consciousness. And that's been so forgotten. And now people take it, if they look at it at all, as just a way to feel good while the world's falling apart, which would be not what I'm talking about at all. We're getting into the deeper levels of that that have been demonstrated on a small scale, but never in our known history uh, on any kind of significant scale that could change things in time. And we're going to work on doing that. Um, started a group for that in beta phase in 2018 called Planetary Healing Club. 
And if you want to be involved in that, you're invited. It involves a lot of work, but primarily inside yourself in a way that can affect your outside life quality and the rest of the world. That's at planetaryhealingclub.com. Other than that, um, you can help us by sharing links to the shows, share the link and the knowledge of Dr. Busby's work. And even though he sees no way, and there's no obvious way to turn it around right now with humans being totally insane and controlled by a malicious power structure, but <clears throat> we're saying there's an actual way to have that change on the physical level. And that's what we're talking about on a, on a deeper um, area of work in, in what I can only call consciousness, but the word doesn't matter. It's the actual fact of doing it, changing something in your, inside yourself that changes the outside world because of the way that we're all networked. And in fact, Dr. Busby talked about it today in the sense of cells affecting each other even with no connection. That, that's a clue to what we're leading to. So that's at planetaryhealingclub.com if you want to find out about that. Otherwise, um, spread the links for us, overcome the censorship. And uh, if you want to keep us on the air, wait, there's a donate button, lostartsradio.com. On the website, there's also a lot of free articles and videos there almost every day posted about what's going on in the world and other interesting topics for educational purposes that are free. And um, so stay in touch there and it'll show what platforms we're on where we haven't been censored and how you can stay in touch. Give us your feedback uh, on the contact form that's on the site, lostartsradio.com. Uh, suggestions for what to get into in the shows with guests or in Planetary Healing Club. And we're really interested in your feedback. Mainly take care of yourself because what you do in your own life even now is affecting everybody and you can make use of that the more you learn so please take care of and value yourself and we'll meet you here again next time have a good week <laughs>